One of the great strengths of role-playing as a hobby is that it's one of the few things that a group of people can do together at the same time, relatively cooperatively, in different ways. Most games, or most hobbies, if you're doing it together, you need to be doing it the same way in sync with each other, such as playing a competitive sport or you know, building something together. But with role-playing, the way that we play, the way the, the experience of play is existing internally or being experienced internally can be different for each person around the table. So one person can be immersed in the game experience, meaning they can be enjoying the mechanical experience of rolling the dice and making game choices about how their character improves or which ability will be used in which situation versus which kind of opponent, that kind of thing. While the person sitting next to them can be immersed in the internal life of their character and the person sitting next to them can be deeply engaged in the developing story. And everyone around the table can be speaking differently. One person can be saying my character, one person can be saying I, one person can be using their character's name and, and you know, in the third person. And none of this needs to matter until it does. And it only matters when the group, as a group, makes a decision to play in a specific way for a specific purpose. We've talked about this before. For the most part, no particular game really needs to be played with a particular intention in mind. You don't need to approach um, Dungeons and Dragons as a sandbox. You don't need to approach it as narrative, right? There are some things which may be easier in some games than others, but for the most part, you could play a World of Darkness game or, what's this, Aces and Eights or Hackmaster or godlike or whatever, you could play them in a sandbox environment, or you could play them in, I'm going to call it a narrative environment. What's the difference here, and how do we achieve them? That's what this clip is about. One big difference in intention when playing is if, as a group, you're sitting down around the table for the purpose of telling a story, and play will follow the template of that story. For example, you're playing investigators and you're going to be solving mysteries. Or you're playing shadow runners and you're going to be going on runs. But, as an intention to play through a story, the players and the game master have it in mind to be moving forward through certain stages of story. There'll be an introduction, there will be something that we're shooting for in the middle, and there will be something at the end. And a classic example of this is in The Princess Bride, uh, Inigo and the Six-Fingered Man. In the narrative version of this tale, then Inigo is hunting down the Six-Fingered Man to get revenge. And clues will be introduced into you know, various sessions as play goes on because the story is about Inigo's quest for revenge. Inigo will encounter people that will help or hinder his search for the Six-Fingered Man and eventually, if you, know, you get to play through it all the way, Inigo will be given the opportunity to face down the Six-Fingered Man and either get his revenge or not. In the sandbox version of this tale, Inigo is created with this desire for revenge against the Six-Fingered Man. And the Game Master creates the Six-Fingered Man, and both of these characters go about their business in the game. And if they meet or don't meet, that's life. If Inigo really wants to track this person down, then the player needs to propel them in this activity, and the Game Master 
should not get in their way by denying them the information that their character is able to uncover. But the Game Master doesn't owe them anything just because they want revenge. They, as the player, using their character, need to make that outcome happen. That really is the difference that I'm defining here between sandbox play and what I'm calling narrative play. The sandbox is full of options, and it has no planned story or planned story template. The characters will encounter things. They'll react to some things. They'll not react to other things. They will put plans in motion, and they will not put plans in motion. It's open. It can be anything. It's allowed to be nothing. The narrative, this is an arc. It's going somewhere. There is there is a plan. It doesn't have to be planned down to the last nail of a railroad. But you're telling a story. This is the difference. In the sandbox, you're looking back, you discover different stories, things that were started and never finished, things that were started, developed, and were finished, things which were definitely shied away from, things that were plunged into headlong. It's full of, of different stories. Some of them can be very confusing and chaotic until enough time has passed, but it's different from the narrative where you're telling a particular kind of story. So how do you handle a sandbox? Because one of the classic complaints about existing in a sandbox is that the players get stalled or that the game master runs out of runs out of world. If you imagine the sandbox as being a map, I think this is a good place to start. Imagine that the players, through the vehicle of their characters, have free reign to go anywhere at any time and do anything that they want or react to anything they want or ignore anything they want within the confines of that map. Imagine that the Game Master presenting that map has the obligation to fill it with a reasonably interesting, meaning properly detailed, appropriately detailed, appropriately active, and appropriately empty, as opposed to completely full and not needing the characters, appropriately empty way. So that as the characters travel through the world, they find things that need doing, that they can do. They find things that are in opposition to them. They find things that need their help. They find things that they cannot stand and want to stamp out or eradicate. Right? much like the real world. Players consistently choosing to do nothing, or whose choices take their characters off the map, are showing you something very clear. What they're showing you is that they may not have the disposition or the interest to play in a sandbox. Conversely, they may just be showing you that they don't know how. We can see this lack of skill for the sandbox in Game Masters as well. This is where there isn't enough information, or there aren't enough real choices, or there really isn't any freedom. In order for characters to act, the players need to have the sort of information that those characters would have if the world were real. They need to understand things in context. They need to be able to, in character, with their character's capabilities, uncover more information that they're interested in. They can't just be expected to operate in a vacuum. But a common error, something that kills sandbox games, is that the world is too empty. It's not that the players can do anything they want. It's just there's really nothing for them to do because there's nothing out there. The only people that exist in any real sense in the world, the only people who are realized, are those characters. There's not enough information. Players can get bound up in you know the classic analysis paralysis. They don't know how to contextualize the information they've been given. They don't know 
that they might be looking at multiple threads of multiple mysteries, and they keep trying to put those those different threads into one mystery because they're they're operating in what they think is a story, not a world. Viewing the game experience in the sandbox point of view is viewing the game experience as a world where not everything has to relate to each other right now. So what do you do when the players have stalled and where the game master is feeling more and more under pressure to guide them into some sort of activity? Do something, do anything, right? The game master doesn't want the game to be boring. The players certainly don't want the game to be boring, but if nothing is happening, of course it's going to be boring. Raymond Chandler, one of the premier noir novelists, uh, once said that if you get stuck in a story, what you should do is, is have someone burst through the door and start shooting. This is a tactic that's often used in role-playing games. Short term, it's a good solution for getting things moving. Long term, it doesn't take the game anywhere. It doesn't take the skill required to play that style of game anywhere. Because when in doubt, when things stall, what the players learn is some kind of plot is going to come to them. As we said at the beginning of the clip, if the purpose was to play in a sandbox setting with this kind of freedom, then that kind of answer is not conforming to what your group has decided to do. So, you have a good group. They're in a sandbox setting. For the most part, they can keep themselves motivated, but sometimes they get bound up. They get distracted by the details, or they can't seem to put the details together. They're stuck. They're stalled. Or they're choosing to protect themselves and waiting for something to happen. What can you do? This is a group problem which needs to be solved by the group. Now, the players, of course, can stop doing nothing. They can choose to start acting, become proactive. If they're truly stuck and can't even begin to figure out how to move forward, we have some decisions to make. Are we going to handle it in-game or out-of-game? In order to reach that goal of freedom, of agency inside the sandbox, a suggestion I would make is to handle it out of game. Do a recap. Review the information in context as the characters would see it. It might not be obvious to the player how their character might interpret the information. What I mean by that is they might not be as familiar with the setting or familiar with past events as the Game Master is or as some of the other players are. And so by reviewing that information and putting it back in context without all of the things that can happen to information, all the distortion that can happen to information, you know, week to week, you're only playing for a few hours per week. There's lots of time for information to evolve into something that it wasn't. A recap or a review of that information can help them have that aha moment. You don't have to lead them by the nose to anything. Just recast in different phrasing or put things together chronologically or talk about things in context. You'll be surprised at how much direction can come from a simple conversation over coffee about the events of the game. And this goes both ways. For the Game Master, listening to what the players think have perceived and the way in which they've perceived it, it can be an incredibly eye-opening experience. How did you get this from that? How did you make that interpretation from what, from what I said? And this is not about correcting them or their interpretation of events or information or character. This is about giving yourself the opportunity to help them discover or to re-experience that information in a whole new way. It's a chance for the players 
through the eyes of their characters to have those eye-opening moments of discovery or realization that something isn't quite the way it was perceived before, or something definitely is what they thought it was, and there's more. So this is an opportunity for you to figure out new ways for them to confirm information or to experience that information in a different context so that they get a clearer picture of, of what was intended or what is really going on. They don't have to be right either. They're not in a story. They're not traveling in an expected direction. What is happening in the sandbox is that we are discovering the choices that can be made, we're making choices, and then playing through the ramifications of those choices. And looking back, we see the tale of our characters' lives. Sometimes this might mean that we get the opportunity to focus on the mundane. We get to explore the character in their normal environment and then enjoy as they move into a less normal environment, into danger or into mystery or intrigue or whatever. But sandbox play is really about exploration. Exploration of the world, exploration of the character. If you're playing as avatars of yourself, you don't really need to explore your own character that much, but you can explore what you would do if you were in this situation. And you're going out seeking situations to experience. If you are adopting a character, a persona, then you're exploring how that character would react to these situations and really getting to explore something. Evil campaigns or campaigns about deceit and seduction, um, about you know paladins, staunch defenders of goodness versus some kind of evil, shadowrunners being greedy or shadowrunners being uh, misunderstood champions of freedom. All of these things can be done in the sandbox style and the focus being on exploring what it would be like. This is different from a narrative approach where what you're exploring is being in that story. And I'm still not talking about railroading. I'm talking about intending to have a specific experience at the table rather than sitting down intending to discover whatever happens. Let's finish off with an example. Let's use Call of Cthulhu as an example. Now, if I want to tell a Lovecraftian story, then I will create an environment, let's say a small town on the East Coast of the United States, and I'll choose a year and I'll talk with the players about what kind of characters they'd like to play and what kind of challenges they'd like to face and what kind of stories they're interested in. And, you know, for example, we might decide if we want a more purist Lovecraftian experience where basically everyone goes mad and dies at the end. Or if we want the pulpier side of Lovecraft where the army gets called in and drops death charges on the deep ones. All right. So we would decide what what theme, what style, what flavor. And then looking at the characters, I would start to plan a story. These characters, how are these characters going to grow? What is the arc of this story going to be? I don't know what events are going to happen at, at various stages, but we're telling a story, right? These investigators facing this particular mythos horror in this particular place, how they uncover it, how they falter, how they recover their strength, how some of them fall, but ultimately they prevail or unfortunately they fail. That's telling a story. Right? We know at the beginning where we are going and all the decisions made in play take us in that direction. And all of the upsets or failures in the game are a part of the challenges or the struggles that we have accepted in getting there. In a sandbox version, I prepare characters. I prepare plots. I prepare agendas. And as we do character creation, we figure out how those characters fit into the world. Right? How are they initially exposed to the mythos and how will this continually hook them or connect them to events which will trigger 
their innate reasons for investigating or compel them in some way to take action in the world to stop evil or save a friend or whatever. Right? There is no plan. The world will have as many or as few horrors in it as needs be to make it achieve the kind of feel that we have discussed is needed. And the characters will be exposed to things as they go about their lives. Right? One of them is a private detective. Someone will come in the door to hire them. And they'll need expert advice bringing in the other characters. Or one of them is a professor who's translating this terrible tome and learns that something is probably going to happen. And again, recruits the help that they need to deal with this horror. The characters are a living, breathing part of the world. And the world is alive and breathing. And things are happening on their own agendas. And the characters act because the players are interested in exploring that world. They're not trying to solve the problem of the Dunwich horror. They are helping their contact. They are freeing their sister. They are responding to things they perceive in the newspaper that suggest a cult is an activity in their area. When all is said and done, when we look back on all the events, then we see what the story was. So, to recap, you've decided as a group to try a sandbox setting, and in play, the game has stalled. What do you do? As the game master, find out from the players what they perceive as what's going on, and what people's motives are, and how things connect. As players, Seek out <laughs> information. Talk to the characters in the game world. Portray your character as though they were real in a real place. Both groups, of course, need to realize what the focus of this style of play is, and they have to be willing to accept that not everyone at the table is going to be that thrilled by it. Some people actually want less freedom. And that's fine. It's fine to play through a story. It's very satisfying to play through a story. It can accomplish an awful lot in a very little amount of time. But if you've decided to try a sandbox, actually run it like a sandbox. If things stall, remember that really, that's okay. <clears throat> remember that in this style of play, the onus for action really lies with the players in terms of how their characters are operating. They may legitimately be deciding to do nothing, but the world doesn't stop. Advance time. Give them information through normal means, radio, television, newspapers, the visit of a friend. Remember that the sandbox is really about possibility. It's filled with possibilities. There is no right course of action. There are only courses of action. What the players choose to do through the vehicle of their characters, that is the story. There is no outside involvement in creating story elements to increase excitement or decrease difficulty or add in a new theme. Right? All of this stuff is decided when you're building the sandbox. It's all about the possibility, options, decisions. It's not about following a classic story arc from beginning to middle to end. It's not about having regimented story breaks. It's just about the freedom to explore. In one sense, this is a leap of faith. The classic story element is a classic for a reason. It speaks to us on a very fundamental level. 
because this is often how we perceive the world or codify the world after the fact. As the game master and as the players, faith is required that at the end of the day, when you look back over the many sessions that were played, a story will be there and you will have authored it, not just followed it.